Right, so uh, this, is, this is my last lecture, and you know, I haven't really said very much of <laughs> what I came here to say, and there's no way I'm going to say even a quarter of it if, uh, in this lecture. So, very f so I've got sort of a plan of what I want to say, the fraction of what I should be saying, but I'm very happy to be sidetracked. If any of you has any special interest uh, or you know, see anything that seems like a good question, then I'm happy to be deviated in that direction and spend the <coughs> rest of the lecture in, in that direction. So anyway, I was, I was reminded this morning um, of a, a theorem that sort of um, flies in the face of the one we, we proved. So what I want to prove is uh, the set of all index values of subfactors contains um, the whole uh, interval from 1 to 4. All real numbers between 1 and 4 uh, can arise as index values of subfactors. So this might come as a surprise after the theorem that I announced in the first, uh, in the first uh, lecture. So I'll, I'll actually give you a quick proof of this theorem, and then you can see whether you prefer this one to the other one. So, so here's the idea. So certainly, certainly one belongs to the set of all index values. OK? The subfactor has index 1, then it's the same as being the, the whole factor. All right, now the second thing is uh, 4 belongs to the set of index values. Um, you could say uh, that you can get this from groups, but I want to exhibit a simpler, um, a simpler uh, construction, which is um, we take n tensor putting inside uh, n tensor similar to matrices. Okay. That's certainly a um, subfactor of index 4, right? I mean, this, if the index means anything, this certainly has index 4 because this is matrices x11, x12, x21, x22. And the index is supposed to count the number of copies of M of this one that you see in this one, well, there's four copies. They're all, here's the orthogonal side, that has index four. So now what I'm going to give you for a particular choice of M, I'm going to give you a continuous family of subfactors which start off being the trivial subfactor and end up being this factor. So therefore the index uh, must vary continuously between one and four, so we have all possible index values. Okay? So I'll give you this nice continuous family. All right, so I'm going to choose M to be itself the tensor product from like 1 to infinity of the two lecture matrices. Um, and I'm going to think of the, this one here. I'm going to change points of view. Let me, sorry about this. I'm unnecessarily confusing. But I, I want to have this. So I'm going to equivalently think of M as being one tensor. Tensor product from... I'm just going to change points of view. It's the same example as just, uh, you know, taking the sense of, if I start as this being the small one, I take the sense of product by the two words you matrices, I get this one. Okay? All right. Now, there's a very special 4x4 four four matrix, which I'm going to call U, which is the permutation matrix. It's 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay? It has the property that in the, this, this is a 4 by 4 matrix, so it belongs to the tensor product of two copies of the 2 by 2 matrix matrices. And it has the property, so obviously it's, it's actually the thing that flips the tensor product around, but if you conjugate by it, um, let me see. Yeah, that was the right. If you conjugate by it, uh, it flips these two around. So add you of x tensor y equals y tensor x. All right, so now what I'm going to do is, in this algebra here, I'm going to define a sequence of unitaries. I'm going to define a sequence of unitaries, and conjugation by them is going to tend to an endomorphism of this algebra. So I'm going to take uh, u, what I'm going to call u1, 
will be equal to u 10 to 1, 10 to 1, 10 to 1. Okay, so I put, so this takes up, this is actually in the first two components of this guy here. And then, so it's not now. And then u2, I'm going to define to be 1 10 to u 10 to 1, uh, 10 to 1, 10 to 1. And, so and then similarly u3 will be 1 10 to 1, 10 to u. So this is very much in the spirit of our matrices, quantum groups, and so on. So very natural thing to do. Then I'm going to look at um, add of u1, u2, u3, up to ux. So this is conjugation by this, and it's going to act on this entire algebra. Okay? So, uh, what you have to convince yourselves of is that this actually is a shift. It shifts everything along. The limit is n tends to the same. First of all, it stabilizes. So if you conjugate by these, if you take a particular element uh, in there, then sufficiently large u's are not going to act on it. Sufficiently large u n is not going to act on it. So this is actually, this limit exists point-wise. And the other is absolutely this is an morphism. And then what I claim is that it does this shift. It takes this tensor probe from angle 1 to infinity and just shifts along one. So it's image is n. Now this is nothing but the same result as if you have, so let's do a slightly simple situation. If you have an infinite set of points here, and these by the natural numbers, and you do the permutation that flips these two, the permutation that flips these two, the permutation that flips those two, and you take the product of those, then all you're doing is just Pushing this point to this one, this point to this one. If you stop at any point, then the last point will go back to the beginning. So if you take the limit, you've actually done the permutation, not a permutation anymore, it actually shifts. Okay? It's very simple. And these are going to be the one to one. Sorry? Uh, uh, I think this is right, isn't it? And, and is this times x times x u n star. Okay. That's right. So what do you want to find? You want to find to add you one, then add you two, then add you three, and so on, right? Yeah, but I can't. No, and this is right. right. It's good to stabilize, and this one stabilizes. Okay, so that's fantastic. We have this endomorphism right from M to N. Whose index, the index of the image, as we've seen, is 4. So we have one point whose index is 1, one point whose index is 4, and then we have this endomorphism. Well, what I claim is that the unitary group, uh, what do we call the unitary group, uh, M4 of, uh, sorry, U4 of C is connected. So I can take a path which goes from one continuous path in U4 and ended up at, at, at this U. Right? And I call these, say, uh, WT. Okay? Well, this game that I played with U and, and doing this product, I can do that for... Um, for WT, so I can take WT, or if I put it upstairs, I can just I can take add of WT1, WT2, WT3, WT4, and so on. The fact that that converges is just as true for W as for U. Okay? And what happens when T is 0? When T is 0, I've got 1, so I'm not doing anything. So the limit is the identity. So the image is uh, the whole thing. So let's call this thing phi sub t of x equals the limit of this x, right? So phi sub phi sub one. So the in index of m and phi sub one is m is one. Right? Here they didn't do anything. The index. M in phi sub, sorry, this is phi sub zero. So 
first described when w is 0 is equal to 1. So phi sub 1 and then is equal to 4. So therefore, the, this family, the images, so m phi sub t of m is a nice continuously varying uh, function going from 1 to 4. So therefore, all index values between 1 and 4 are attained. Okay. So there we have the theorem that I said at the beginning that you only get these four cos squared pi over n and something that completely contradicts it. So I guess I shouldn't let you choose which one is true because one of them is true, one of them is false, and thank God this one is false. But it's also just as well I didn't know about this when I started. This actually came after I proved the opposite result. So it's kind of convincing. Okay. I'll let you think about where the gap is, and this, what, the, what is the mistake in this argument. I mean, certainly, you know, when I was very first attempts to answer this index question, I thought about, well, maybe you could get a, you know, just like, I thought maybe you could do exactly this, and therefore it would be any number bigger than one, but uh, fortunately that failed. <coughs> well, fortunately, I never saw this example. Um, all right, so that was just a little bit of a teaser to start the, start the lecture. So who's got the answer? Sunder. If you want to come to this assumption, we can still the symmetric as it is, right? Uh, well, that's correct, yes. Yeah. And one of them obviously isn't in the, in the appropriate topology. But again, I would say this gives you a... a feel. So what, the answer is the index is not continuous in the topology for which this, this family is continuous. But it's a very continuous family, it's sort of surprising. So you wonder about what, you know, what kind of topology the index is continuous in. Um, that's not entirely, uh, not entirely clear. Certainly not in the one for which this is continuous. So is it the upper It's something like that in this topology. Yeah, it only jumps one way. Actually, you know, this, this example introduces a whole family, a whole different uh, direction of research. You could vary this. You could take any unit theory you like. In the, um, you could replace 2 by n. You could take any unit theory in the tensor product of the n by n matrices with itself and do this game, and you get endomorphisms. And uh, the question of what is the index of the image of that is an interesting one. Uh, as far as I know, this hasn't been studied in a long time. Uh, it was first studied by uh, a student of mine, Peter Ackerman, who got some nice results. Maybe there's some people doing endomorphism with Kuntzels that have got more results since then. Yeah. Um, from, from here, you can only say contains 1 to 4, not equal to 4. Uh, well, contains, right. But 1, 4 are there, so right, right, contains. Right, right, right. Can, from here, this argument only gives you that. From here. But let me remind you that this argument is false. Okay, this is not correct. Okay. So after that little uh, comment, comment, but rather interesting So, um, I spent a lot of time, uh, well, enough time um, yesterday telling you what a planar algebra was. So, the idea was that we had these things called planar angles. Um, which are uh, drawings like this, which you can think of up to this stuff if you like, but uh, you can also think of them as being very rigid. 
And uh, the excerpt of planar algebra was a, was a great vector space, Pn. And this number n is supposed to correspond to the number of boundary points on these disks. And the idea is that, that each one of these disks defines a multilinear map from the Cartesian product of the vector spaces corresponding to the internal disk to the uh, to Pn. I have one question. He said that in your definition you insist on at least one internal. Right, absolutely. So this is what I was going to point out immediately. So because, I mean, I don't just insist on it, I don't know what to do if there's no internal disk. Right? The, just the formalism doesn't tell me what to do. It's supposed to be a multilinear map from a bunch of vector spaces. Well, what if there's no vector spaces? Well, you're into the theory of the empty set. But, but, but that would be the other thing not for multi I mean, if it was tensor product, then the convention is it's the underlying field. Okay. But if you were happy with that always, then you know you're a very uh, happy man. Because <laughs> if I'm worried, if, if I want to know what to do when there's nothing to work on, then I wouldn't be satisfied with that. Okay. That's a very important point because uh, one could go the, the nearest structure to this planar algebra is that of operator. Uh, just to resume what Sundar said, this axiom of planar algebra only applies if there are internal disks. If there's no internal disk, I'm not saying anything. So if I have a picture like this, it's not, it's not in the definition of the planar algebra, it says nothing whatsoever about such a picture. Nothing. Unless you're allowed to convince it or whatever you think it's possible. Sorry? Unless you have a kind of... But even then, what does it mean? Well, it means that there's a linear map from... The scalars to that P. Scalars to that P. To the N. Right. Which... So that but then what about naturality with respect to the gluing? So you, have to, you have to think quite carefully. But anyway, I want to point out that I really do want to have the planar algebra action of saying nothing about things with no input. Okay, and there's good reasons for this. Um, so I was led to this and, and the insistence on, on this fact by uh, looking at the operator literature, which is being quite inspirational. Um, although I wouldn't say that it's produced any. This is the best insight that it's produced, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, so what are operators? Well, operators are sort of this kind of thing. They're sort of algebraic structures where you have, uh, we're supposed to take into account operations with lots of lots of inputs into the operations. So the idea is that uh, an operator is supposed to code some things like something like that, where you can, where you have an operation which which uh, I guess it's it's going down this way. You put in a whole lot of things here and you get something out at the bottom. So very similar to uh, to what we're doing here, but in the simplest case of operators, you're always allowed to put in, um, you're always allowed to compose. Here we're only allowed to glue the disks uh, if, well, we were ridiculously strict about it, but ultimately we're only allowed to glue the disks if the number of boundary points is compatible when we're doing the gluing. Okay? Uh, but in operators, you're always allowed to compose in the simplest version. So you find that um, the operators, is if you have one of these and then you have other ones up here, Then that, the, the gluing operation, the gluing action for operators says that if you have these things here, then you have another operation uh, which takes you know, many more inputs and ends up giving you an output. So what they do is they have these set CI, and they have the basic underlying structure that needs to work on is some kind of something that has a tensor product, and then they actually decide that. Okay. Let me not go into it, it will take too long, I might get it wrong. Anyway, it's all, this is all spelled out in my notes and my later in the planar algebra course at Vanderbilt uh, with the details. And, um, so, uh, the, you know, all of these things like this thing about the ambiguity of where, you know, assigning the indices to the, to the edges are all naturally taken care of in the operator formula. Uh <clears throat>
So, uh, in, in particular, one, that one can define different kinds of algebra, such as uh, associative algebra, Lie algebra, and so on, as being uh, you have a certain operad, and the algebra is what's called an algebra over the operad, which means exactly the same as this operad acts on some vector space. Okay, now one is graded because we have this number of points. In, general, in this case, it won't first instance be uh, graded. So, um, right, so in, in particular, associative algebras are algebras over the associative operad. So there's a certain one of these structures called the associative operad. And by definition, an associative algebra is an algebra over the operand. The operand language has exactly the same problem. What if there's no inputs thing to the thing? What, I mean, what, do you, what do you do? Well, you need an extra piece of structure, and that extra piece of structure ends up being, in the case of associative algebra, an identity. So in order to de deal with things with no input, you need to have an identity. So, uh, Unital algebra, unital associative algebra, an operad. You have these axioms saying giving you the action of the operad, and then you have extra ones saying that there's a map basically from the scalars into the algebra when you translate that to the form of it, which has the right property. Okay, so what's the lesson for us? It says whatever we do when we want to handle. Uh, uh, tangles with no input disks, that corresponds to the identity. So in other words, if I say if I have a planar algebra and I tell you what to do with things with no input disks, that's the same as having a unical planar and planar algebra with identity. And uh, so that's the, the next action of a planar algebra is a unital planar algebra. <coughs> okay, so that's Compatible, blah, 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 is an obvious way. This is compatible with the line. Because, you know, if you have an a, a tangle with no input disks, you can glue that into something, get, an, into a string, a tangle, get another one, and so on. There's two ways to do things. And there's an obvious uh, compatibility, and you want that to be true. So, how many, now the question is, uh, which I guess I haven't yet. Um, approached. How many tangles are there with no input disks? Well, this is the famous Catalan numbers. Uh, given, well, given n boundary points, how many tangles with no input disks? Well, what I just said was the Catalan numbers. Well, that's absolutely false, of course, because in fact, there's an infinite number of such things. You can start putting, you can put, uh, you know, some fairly arbitrary configuration of closed circles in there, and that's a that's a that's a tangle uh, with no input disks. So, in fact, infinite. But you can cut that down to size a bit by insisting that it be connected. This may, you know, this. Uh, the theory of what's going on, if there are these input disks, has not really been completed because most of the interest is focused on the case where, for one reason or another, you can just get rid of these input disks. So, <coughs> so we get the result that um, the, num the, the number of such tangles connected, we add the word connected. And by connected, I mean simply that there are no uh, closed strings. 
then we get the answer to this, which is very easy to calculate, is zero, because n is odd. And it's uh, one over n plus one, two n to the n. n to the n. So these are the famous Catalan numbers. Which were discovered um, by Fuss a hundred years before Catalan, and I think by Euler a uh, hundred years before. But, you know, you could say Newton really, was at least back to Newton, because you run into them when you do some very simple uh, Taylor theory. Just put the, put the point on. Uh, anyway, these are the famous uh, numbers. Um, they start off with something like one, one. Two, three, five. Uh, whoops, no, two, five, fourteen, forty-two. Is it 142? The next one. Sure. And then they get bigger. Um, the asymptotic growth rate is something like, like one over n times four to the n. <coughs> so, um, but anyway, so what we see is what's kind of neat in planar algebras in terms in the comparison with associative algebras that if you, they have a highly enriched identity. Instead of the identity just being one element, all of a sudden the identity consists of all of these Catalan guys. All of these, uh, these, these things are called, for ridiculous reasons, they really shouldn't be, they're called temporally leap diagrams. This is an example of physicists dominating the language. Templin and Leap had absolutely nothing to do with them. Uh, they should be credited in this context to Kaufman. Um, so anyway, so 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 that's the that's the thing, you know, this the the, uh, the uh, idea of sort of a unital planar algebra has this highly enriched uh, identity which is consistent with all of these pictures. They make sense, uh, they give you elements in any uh, unital planar algebra. Of course, these elements may or may not be zero, um, and they may, they may, in general, they may or may not be linearly uh, independent. <clears throat> That's an interesting question. Okay. So uh, now I want to get on to. Uh, let's see. Let me just make sure I'm getting everything here. What's next on the list? Um, okay. So right. The next thing I have to talk about is various versions. This, this, what I've said here, with uh, just the, the disk that's also got to be dollar signs, which is necessary for all kinds of things, particularly if you want to do the gluing. Um, when the things are defined up to isotopy, you certainly need these uh, <coughs> dollar signs. Actually, some more thought needs to go into the fact that it's well defined without dollar signs with my gluing. I, I haven't got to the bottom of that yet. Maybe something interesting to say. <coughs> uh, okay, so this is what I call a vanilla planar algebra, simply because this is the non-negotiable structure that has to be there. Okay, I've got it there. Now there's all kinds of variations on it, and I'm going to talk about some of them. What, the one that Zeff talked about yesterday, we had the, the, the strings were oriented in an alternating way, which forced the number of boundary points around every disk to be even. Uh, and you can see that that's related, you know, this temporally lead structure is supposed to be quite rich. Um, and it lies in this world with an even number of uh, things around every, every disk. Um, but there's all the, the vast number of other uh, decorations that you can imagine giving sort of plain out there. The most important one for us at the moment is going to be shading. So I'm going to have the concept of a shaded planar algebra. It's just going to be the same. You know, in order to get the planar algebra, you just have to define what you mean by planar tangles. Well, I'm going to say a, planar, a shaded planar tangle is going to be one in which the uh, regions of the tangle admit a, uh, a shading. So a shading is, is a two-coloring in the graph uh, terminology. So let's 
So the difficulty in, in doing this has led me to the statement that with probability one, a random, a random integer is odd. Very odd probability. So, um, so there's an example of a shaded algorithm. Now you'll notice that we need, we also need the dollar signs, right? Even though know, you don't need them for growing, you need them to make sense of this. So uh, now, the, so you can see there's two possibilities. The dollar signs. They index, they, they're sitting on these intervals of the boundary, and uh, you'll, you'll see that in the shaded case, they can either go in shaded regions or unshaded regions. So therefore the disks into which we're inputting things are also going to have two kinds, uh, those where the dollar is in the shaded region, and those where the dollar is in the unshaded region. Right? So this means that you have to add to the, the P, we, we have Pn, a little planar algebra, because it, it just depends on the number of boundary points, you have to add a uh, plus or minus or uh, something mod 2 to take account of the fact that this dollar sign may go in the shaded or the unshaded region. Okay? Um, it's a fairly innocent uh, addition, basically. It, it doesn't change very much. These Pn plus and Pn minus are sort of canonically identified with each other, so it's sort of They're, uh, they're uh, how can I say, redundant, very redundant data, but it makes the whole presentation much more symmetric and aesthetically satisfying. You can see the necessity of it right here. You could get away with um, not having these by saying that the dollar signs have to go in the shaded or the unshaded shaded regions only, but that's, uh, anyway, I, I should add that a lot of these things uh, started out differently, but with great reluctance, I was forced to um, change the definitions. So that's a shaded planar algebra. Shaded planar algebra can be unitable or not. And now let me talk also about star planar algebra. And I've never been quite sure whether they should be called star planar algebras or planar star algebras. Um, but so, in the vanilla case, so there's this philosophy that all I have to do is do the vanilla case and you can guess what happens in the, in the, in the other case. So in the vanilla case, we require that P, each Pn, each Pn, as a conjugate linear involution. Involution of star. So the PNs become star, uh, star vector spaces. And the, the axiom that a planar algebra is a star planar algebra is extremely simple. Remember that I could have said that the, uh, that it's just simply, in the definition of planar algebra, I said that the mappings, these multilinear mappings, I never gave them a notation, but if T is a tangle, this is supposed to be the multiple, no, this is a tangle. When the Z sub T is supposed to be the multilinear map. And I, uh, I said that it was dependent on T only up to isotopy. Uh, I didn't really spell out the details of that, but you can guess what they are. So I could have replaced isotopy by orientation preserving diffeomorphism because that's the same thing in these low dimensions. It's to say that two tangles are isotopic is the same thing as saying that there's an orientation preserving diffeomorphism of the plane which sends one to the other. Okay? Then you can say, well, what about orientation reversing diffeomorphisms? Well, that's exactly what the, um, the, uh, the star structure is. It simply says that uh, Z, that Z of T is is appropriately invariant with respect 
respect to borders. Mm -hmm. So if I have any diffeomorphism and I take a, a, a plane entangle, I can apply that diffeomorphism to it and I get another plane entangle. And then I can stick into the into disks of that plane entangle and stick in things. And then the, the thing is, there's only one way to write down something that makes sense with complex conjugation and the bars and so on. And that is uh, the definition of the azimuth, so the star plane now. Okay. So that works beautifully in this case. If I take this and I apply an orientation reversing diffeomorphism, I get another tangle. The dollars are sent somewhere, and the shaded regions are sent somewhere, and the definition would work. Okay. So that's what a star planar algebra is. Planar star algebra. So I've had this def decoration, I had the shading, and by the way, the shading, of course, is the same thing as what Jeff was talking about yesterday, where we alternate these orientations. Because if you had the shading, you can think of these as regions of the plane and the orient the boundary according to the induced orientation. Um, so, the, so the shading is always on the left, say, if you go around. So it's the same thing. You'll notice that, uh, that uh, there's a, a really painful one of these really painful things, which is um, for sh shaded tangles can only exist if the number of boundary points is always even. So it's it's tempting uh, to divide that number of boundary points by two. Now that's not quite compatible with what we were doing in vanilla tangles. We had, uh, uh, okay, I, I like this so much dividing by two that I would almost be tempted to say that, you know, in the vanilla case you should divide by two also. So you'd have half, you know, you'd have P1 half and P1, P3 halves and so on, which fits in nicely with spin and what the physicists do. Um, but you know, that's not likely to, to, to fly. So we have to live, unfortunately, with this ambiguity of what n means. So what n means when I'm talking about a shaded tangle is half of the number of boundary points. And if I'm talking about a vanilla tangle, it means exactly the number of boundary points. Okay? That's just the nastiness that minimals have to work with. Um, maybe I'll... I just make one remark for people who... Usually the star is, the orientation of the strings and the shading is, is reversed to what you have. It is it's supposed to be the shading. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm happy to go along with that. There's obviously two possible conventions. Whatever one you know. Yes, of course. And then we used to do it for yoga. Right, so now I want to introduce another kind of uh, planar algebra with some decoration because there's a, there's a. So I should say at the outset, I was extremely reluctant to go beyond these shaded, these shed subfactor and so on planar algebras because I wanted something that was real, that had honest applications. But now the applications are starting to come, so I'm sort of forced to admit that planar algebras are more general than just these ones which are aimed at subfactors. And indeed, even in the world of, of two one factors, uh, there's good reason to extend to a bit more general. So the next one is uh, oriented plane. Okay. And then you can, you know, you can start once you've got into the swing of things for adding extra structure, adding decorations. You can go wild you know, and say, well, why not? Put arbitrary labels on the strings, put arbitrary labels in the regions, and so on. Okay, well, I guess I have to admit that those will all uh, lead to structures which have a right to be called planar algebras. <coughs> but, you know, as a great believer in Occam's razor, I'm only going to you know, really study them uh, if they have some, if they correspond to some object which I like, or which has some guts to it. <coughs> so the next thing is oriented. PAs, and here we're going to go back to the vanilla situation. No particular reason to have even numbers of strings, but what we're going to do now is we're going to orient the strings completely arbitrarily. Okay. Completely arbitrary. 
So that's the the uh, that's the uh, operator. And some dollar sign. Um, of course, gluing you're only going to be able to glue if the orientation is lined up. So I can only glue something in here if the if the outgoing things of the tangle that I'm gluing in go in the right directions. Okay, so that's one thing. The gluing I have to take care of that boundary structure. And the second thing is, um, second thing is, when I define a planar algebra over this, so that goes to the operator. Planar algebra over that, the notion, uh, well, it's going to have to have a vector space is p n, but n instead of just being a number now, it has to be the whole sequence of orientations around the boundary. So I'll write that by p sub n, where this is a vector of zeros and ones. Or up and down, or whatever it is. A vector of z plus one minus one, whatever you want to call it. So n equals uh, an arbitrary sequence of ups, ins and outs around the boundary. Okay. So for computers, obviously, zeros and ones are better to put here than up arrows and down arrows. And for formulae, often it's much nicer if you actually have plus or minus one. Anyway, the idea is obvious. You've got to have, you have to give the data, you have to give these vector spaces to everything. Planar algebra, oriented planar algebra will be yeah. an algebra over this operator. Okay? And uh, um, I guess Zeph's, uh, the tensor, tensor networks that he was doing in the beginning give an example of this where, where this uh, arrow, the orientations give you the possibility of telling, you know, distinguishing between V and its dual, vector space and its dual. And you can do the whole theory without having without having a basis. All you need is the, the pairing between the vector space and the dual. I should also say at the outset, uh, I should have said a long time ago, that this, my, these planar algebra sort of my take on the whole thing. There's all kinds of other people who have come up with similar structures. Uh, Greg Kupenberg was perhaps the first with his spiders. And then the, tensor, the category people got in on the game, they tend to do. And uh, so these things are intimately related to tensor categories, pivotal tensor categories, spherical tensor categories, two categories, and so on, all kinds of categories. But uh, you know, to make the exact dictionary between all these objects would be, uh, would be a paper in itself. So, and, and once again, my guiding philosophy was I only want something which has some analysis type structure, some honest tilt spaces associated with it. So let's do that for the case of shaded algebras and then the case of oriented planar algebras where I believe it's work in progress. But, uh, It's um, the dimension of P zero plus or minus is one, and the dimension of P n is less than infinity n plus or minus small n. Okay, so these are just. Uh, just a fairly easy condition, but doesn't require, <coughs> you know, the, I'm, just, I'm not allowed to assume these things. I mean, it's not, I'm not doing anything. Okay, here, the, 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 here's the real, the main one. Uh, the six, and this is going to be uh, require a little, a small discussion, which Jeff also did, which is you can define if you have a planar algebra satisfying these conditions here, then you can define a uh, sesqui linear form. You can define a b on the planar algebra, and it's an it's going to be a nice exercise in working the formalism anyway. What I claim is that it's this. Let me 
put the upside down in there as well. And some, maybe some shading. So what's going on here, I've got an element A is in a particular, A and B belong to a particular PN plus or minus. Same plus, same minus PN epsilon. So the doll is going in the same shading. And then, so let's just work the formalism to see what this means. If sesquial linear form has got to be a number, right? So uh, <clears throat> what does this mean? We take A, we take B. It's a star algebra, so we can take B star. We take that in mind. The, uh, this is a, what I've drawn is a tangle, shaded tangle. It ends up in P0, in this case, P0 plus. But I've said that P0 plus is one dimensional. So that means it's a scalars. So it's a scalar, but uh, only it's an actual, an actual number. But, you know, it's a multiple of, it's, it's an element of a one dimensional complex vector space. It's only a number if I can identify that complex vector space canonically with C. But uh, because it's a unital planar algebra, because it's a unital planar algebra, this guy has to give me a canonical, so this is something with a dollar in it, no input disks. But um, since it's unital, no input disks makes sense. So this gives me an actual, actual element of P0 plus. Okay, so I call that one, I make that, well actually you can check by the axiom, so there has to be, um, if it's, it's square, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, this is one. Okay, it's not a question of normalization, this is forced to, I suppose it is a Identify the, complex numbers canonically in such a way that this is equal to one. So therefore this thing becomes a number. A number. And the axiom is that this is a positive definite in the product. And then there's a seventh axiom which you may or may not want to spherical in the It's just not going into that. It's not, it doesn't really matter very much for a story. So these are the axioms of a subfactor planar algebra. Okay. And there's a theorem, which is basically Jim Popper, which says that um, given a subfactor PA, there exists a subfactor. For which P n plus uh, is equal to this n prime intersect n k, uh, I guess P n minus one. So uh, there's two. There's basically two facts here. I guess I never said one. Maybe that's, uh, I didn't say. It, I meant to say it. The, these invariants, these uh, the standard invariant, these higher relative commutators later on the centralized work, blah, blah, blah. they form a planar algebra, subfactor planar algebra. And the converse is true. Given a subfactor planar algebra, there exists a subfactor m contained in m, having this as its uh, standard invariant. Okay. So this is a wonderful theorem. And this is, for me, it's a justification for the existence of these planar algebras, because in the theorem, it says pretty much the same thing as a subfactor. Subfactor is life itself, so therefore it's uh, okay. <laughs> All right, now we go over to um, oriented planar algebras. So this is a theorem that doesn't really, strictly speaking, exist. I'm working on it with Noah Snyder, but we've been working on it with three years without ever uh, doing anything except to agree that it's true. <laughs> so oriented. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to say a bimodule uh, uh, or a correspondence, let's say correspondence planar algebra is, and I'll take I'll take these definitions over here. First of all, it's an uh, oriented planar algebra, and second, it's unital. So that means that these temporary lead diagrams make sense when they're oriented. Okay, given the temporary loop diagram, there's going to be lots of ways in which it can be oriented. Right? You can orient 
the things arbitrarily. And, it's, and each one of these is going to define the element of this plane algebra. Now the dimension. This is an interesting remark. Maybe I'll just keep going and say something about that. You say if you give yourself the orientations on the boundary, obviously there's got to be the same number going in as coming out for any of these typically lead things to make sense. Um, so you can say, you know, how many are there in general? Given the pattern of orientations on the boundary, how many are there? Okay. How many typically lead diagrams are there with that orientation? Um, and second, you know, since this is supposed to be a rich structure, when do you get the most? Okay, so well... One thing is obvious is if the orientations are all up on one side and all down or going in on the other side, then there's only one way to do it. So that's... So it can be very small, depending on the... On the other hand, if the boundaries alternate in orientation, then any temporary leap diagram can be stuck in. And you get the uh, Catalan number there. So this is just as obviously the maximum. So the most you can get is this Catalan. So this is some kind of moral justification for why the shaded case is so interesting. The unital structure, which is some enrichment, is most rich in the shaded case. It's when you're going to get the most bang for the buck out of the unital structure. So that's some kind of size for that. Now, the, now there's the question of what exactly is the number of these things. If you give yourself the orientation in that, well, I solved this. Um, it's in the Vanderbilt notes. I've forgotten what the answer is. The, the, the trick was to use um, sort of Wojcicki type stuff. There's an explicit answer. It's the number of. Anyway, it's not this. So he can probably do it in his head. There's some free, you can show the word free to get down. Unital. So, oriented planar algebra is a correspondence planar algebra. Oriented unital star PA. Uh, maybe I should say there's one nasty feature which I haven't yet made my piece with, and Jeff said it yesterday because he had to. But if you take oriented planar algebras and you do this, you apply an orientation reversing diffeomorphism, you have to also reverse the direction of the arrow. The image of the orientation under the under the diffeomorphism, but then you have to. I think. I mean, it's one of these things where orientation is reversed to the plane, so induced and so on. Anyway, and you have to. Be careful a little bit with what you do with the orientations of the other. It's probably canonical, the right thing to do if you stay with the orientations. For the dimension of P0 is equal to 1. There's no P0 plus or minus. 0 is a vector, no orientation to worry about. Uh, 6, uh, 5, uh, dimension Pn is less than infinity for all vectors uh, n. And six, um, AB is positive. Positive definite specific linear form. Well, Jeff's plane, Jeff's uh, uh, networks give an example. Scan where the arrows give you the possibility of distinguishing it between um, base and its dual, and thereby. Eliminating the need for basis. Um, there's lots and lots of other examples, and the theorem that Noah and I claim is, is true is that there's a correspondence between. <laughs> correspondence is a bad word, isn't it? Look, map between correspondences. There's a correspondence between correspondences and these, uh, uh, this kind of object oriented uh, correspondence plane algebra. Theorem will be proved. Morris Moida. Correspondences, correspondences, correspondence, correspondence. Okay. 
Uh, this is correspondence in the sense of Alan Kong, uh, whereas, whereas um, it's, a volume, it's basically a whole space between um, general two correspondence correspondence between M and Arrow going between them can't be, you can't expect it to be one to one or faithful or anything like that. Just because it's not true that even in the subtract case, you have to say what's M, uh, and you know, it's not going to, the planar algebra is not going to capture everything about M in general, it's going to be a minimum of questions for planar and so on and so forth. Um, but there should be a theorem and uh, the invariance of a correspondence that you're going to pick up by the, what, what this planar algebra is going to do is going to be exactly, you're going to take this correspondence V, which you call V, and you're just going to look at V, tends to V bar, tends to V, tends to V, and so on. This is the dual correspondence. And the vector spaces P, Pn are going to simply be the, I guess it's the, uh, uh, it's the home from this to the trivial one, to M itself, L2 of M. Every time we try to make progress on actually writing down this theorem, I think it's, it's almost trivial to prove. Um, we get stuck into the classification of these correspondences. Even in very small index. The correspondences have a left dimension, right dimension, even when these are very small. Uh, the classification is not done. So this ADE classification, which I'm talking about, about the subtractors needs to be enriched somewhat to get the correspondences. But, you know, look at now, taking a look back. So these are, uh, this, are they 2 1 fighters? Yeah, 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 staying in the 2 1 world. And you want finite dimension both ways, right? Yeah. Um, looking back with sort of infinite hindsight, you know, I, I look back to 19, the year 1980, and I think, you know, that was right when correspondences were coming out. And, I, and my original ideas on the index actually could immediately be translated into things about these left and right dimensions of correspondences. And I could well have gone in this direction at this stage. You know, it's sort of an accident of history that I was more interested in the subtractors than correspondences. So it could have been that this was the uh, a fiendish uh, undertaking because the the uh, the theorem that realized planar algebras was this theorem of Popper's where he had this lambda lattice and he did this construction that he added some auxiliary um, continuous um, uh, non-atomic um, for Newton algebra and then he did some amalgamated free product and so on and did some complicated mysterious complicated computations and he got this result out. Um, I was never very happy with that construction and I never, say, in some sense, I never fully understood it, even though I went through it in my seminar three or four times, I'm sure. Seth will probably remember. <laughs> he may have been forced to give one of the talks on this. Uh, but, you know, a few years ago, uh, for me, a very revelatory thing happened and that was I managed to get another proof of Popper's result. Uh, coming out of some work that was going in a completely different direction with Elise Guionet. And uh, uh, Sunda and Vijay have played a big part in this, in the development of this work, so I'd like to tell you a, a little bit about this. And it makes the, the one direction of this correspondence thing uh, rather easy to prove, at least as soon as one can sit down and write, write out the details. In fact, it's easier than the subfactor one in, in a way that you'll see. Um, so. We want to show that because every correspondence P A there is a correspondence. So I've got to come up with a von Neumann algebra. And instead of going through this pay, painful hyperfinite construction, which would work only in finite depth and so on and so forth, uh, I'm going to use this um, graded algebra approach and it will just work very simply. Almost. It seems like cheating. You get this, these two one factors. So here, let's, let's do it. <coughs> I think we've got a working 
fuck now, so it's... And I'm going to make a couple of uh, uh, philosophical remarks that I hope one day will inspire someone to solve all those mathematical problems. No. Uh, so I haven't gone into it, and, and it's, it's um, not fair that I haven't gone into it. So I have to, you know, a planar algebra, when you see it for the first time, uh, I've said that there's every time you have one of these planar tangles is an operation. Okay, so we're thinking of it as an algebraic structure with many, many, many operations. But I've just been drawing these ad hoc tangles every time. So you might think that these operations are just, there's a few of them and they're not very, you know, kind of arbitrary. That's not at all the case. Uh, a, a planar algebra, these planar tangles, a set of planar tangles contains all kinds of beautiful ones. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you one planar tangle which makes one algebra structure. But in fact, looking at all these planar tangles, I haven't, every time I think, well, that's all of the algebra. So what, those set of algebra structures, I think. That's it, I've got the whole list, there's no more. And then a month later, I'll say, oh, look, there's another one, there's another one, and so on. And there's a, even in this very simple one, there's an open problem of classifying all of the ways of doing it, which gives you. Uh, associated with algebra structure. So, so let's say a graded algebra structure. So let me do it in the vanilla setting, and then we'll talk about how you have to change it uh, in the shaded and oriented setting. So, P n. We're going to think of this as a graded vector space. And you will know that if you have a, if you have a graded algebra for a graded vector space, it's going to be, it's going to get, we're going to have to give a structure p n cross p n to p n plus n. So it's, this is a, it's an n graded, n n n zero graded vector space. So we've got to give this this kind of operation in a way that's linear and associative. The definition of graded planar algebra is also going to be. Unital. So let's suppose we have a unital vanilla planar algebra. Okay, so I want to cut, in order to make this into a graded algebra, associative algebra, I've got to get a multilinear map from here to here. Key is multilinear, bilinear in this case. So we know that our tangles give multilinear maps. So maybe I can get such a Map from a tangle, so that's indeed the case. Here's the tangle. So I just have to tell you, in order to complete it, I have to put the dollar signs in. There it is. There's a tangle. Now we go back to the axioms of a planar algebra. What do they say? They say that every tangle gives a multilinear map from the Cartesian product of the vector spaces corresponding to the internal disks to the output disk. So if this is n, if this, in this case I've done n equals 3 and m equals 6. And I've ended up in, see, this, this, gets, this tangle by the axioms of the planar algebra gives a bilinear map from p3 across p6 to p9. And replacing 3, 6, and 9 by n, n and m, we get the right thing. So these tangles, with 3 and 6 replaced by n and m, give you a graded algebra structure on any vanilla planar algebra. It may or may not be associative. Well, it follows from the axioms. A little game in the axioms of uh, isotopy invariance will check that this is associative. Associative. OK. Oh, sorry, an associative uh, graded. Take the star, then it becomes a, a star algebra in the obvious way. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah, each PN is unitive, right? No, 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 no. Your PNs are not unitive. So, plane algebra is unitive, 
equal to the law compatibility between the unit and the quantification. So the unital structure is very simple. Uh, I don't really need the full unital structure on the plane of algebra. But this element here, right, according to our axioms of unitality, that represents an element of the planar algebra. Well, it's obvious that that's an identity for the greater uh, element. So it's unital. So it's a okay. In fact, we've got a lot more, which we can kind of explore later on, but I'm not going to get tired. So now I should say that I thought about this structure on the planar algebra from the very earliest days of planar algebras. And I even have a little notebook somewhere with some interesting notes on it, uh, which I'm trying to find because I believe there's a third construction um, that we have to un unearth. But uh, the, the, the trouble is that I never, I, I never put a long time, I never put the right trace on this alpha, I never gave it the right structure. Um, and the, uh, the, the, what happened was eventually, um, I spent a, at least Guillaume spent a year at Berkeley and we talked a lot and uh, without a total mutual miscomprehension, mis but eventually you know, something came out of it. So uh, this, this, the key is the following, the key is to understand what this planar, what this associative algebra is, in the particular case of Zeff's network algebra, that's a vanilla, that's a vanilla um, planar algebra. So let's go to the situation where we, we're putting um, indices on this on, on all this, this, this thing. Okay, and, and let's suppose that the index set contains two elements. So instead of i and one, so we take x and y. If you like x and y as a basis for the underlying vector space, okay? Then what is an element of the planar basis element of the planar algebra is simply an x, the sign of x or y due to the string, x, y, z, sorry, not the x and y, x, y, x, 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 y, y, x, y. And what's the multiplication? Well, it's nothing but, you know, the product of these two is the element x, y, x, 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 y, 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 and so on. So in other words, we can think of this as a very familiar uh, actual multiplication. In this case, we're taking a word on x and y, and a word on another word on x and y, and simply writing one after the other. So this means that in this case, the special case of Zeff's planar algebra, the networks, tensor networks, this planar algebra is nothing but the algebra of non-commutative polynomials in a certain number of variables, where the number of variables is the number of indices in the certain network. So there's a very important example, e.g., in the case of spin network, of tensor networks, we obtain the algebra of non-commutative non polynomials in, let's say, k variables. Well, once again, K is a dimension of the underlying vector space of the tensor network. What about the star structure? Well, these stars are self-adjoint. K is self-adjoint variables. So the adjoint of a word is just read the word backwards. Okay, now, so th if you like this, these uh, graded algebras are simply family of generalizations of this um, non commutative polynomial. The sort of polynomials and things that aren't really variables, they're sort of planar algebra fuzziness. But in this particular case, this particular planar algebra, that's exactly what they are. Okay, now, what, what happened was that Elise and I, who has been this work of of Mingo and, and uh, Spiker and other people and so on. In fact, eventually it was clear it got traced right back to the physicist Tuft, Tuft um, where they were drawing pictures in these matrix, random matrix theory 
And the pictures were like the plane algebra pictures, not just like them, identical in every respect. I had trouble convincing them that this the right way because of the jewel picture and so on. But, you know, eventually they end up drawing their pictures, so they're exactly the same as, as the ones in uh, planar algebra. So there was some mystery as to what the connection was, and that's what we were really trying to solve. So what we were really after was to get this connection. So is there some connection, some kind of random matrix um, models for planar algebras? And that's ultimately what we got with Dima Sliatenko. Um, and the bonus was that we got these random matrix models where the number of random matrices was actually non-integer. So something of a certain amount of interest to the physicists. But of course, not just, you know, pie in the sky, but serious. Uh, these are genuine Hilbert space random and, you know, real limits of random, random matrices. Uh, okay, so but the, the lesson for this was because of random matrices, and because of Wojcicki's uh, work on interpreting the large n limit of uh, Gaussian of the GUE random matrices, what Wojcicki came up with was a trace, a trace of this algebra. And this was the ingredient that had been missing for many years. Can you make it mark? Sorry? Can you make it mark? Yeah. It is a random matrices. There is actually there are actually discussions convincing of the correlation functions with the random matrices to some pre entropy of the virtual exclusion. Sure, sure. There exists some correlation matrices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the game. But what we're doing is that's the, you know, all of that is the special case of the um, tensor network planar algebra. What, I, what, what, our, what we have done is generalize that, so all of these results that people have done on entropy and so on can be now uh, potentially generalized to these more general uh, graded algebras coming from planar algebras. Can you also frame this uh, lens? Sorry? You put an arrow, you put an orientation. Can you also put a frame? Uh, let's let's not get into that. Yes, but uh, I, I don't want to. I have <laughs> eight minutes to finish my series of lectures. So, <coughs> so a, a trace on this algebra, a trace, and the trace was something that one would never have thought of. I don't think without going through this random matrix uh, thing, and that was the following. It's a very simple trace. It, it uses the unital structure now in a big way, and introduces another ingredient into this sort of operatic thing, which I don't really know, which I'm searching for an understanding of. And that's the following. We, so so I, I, on the graded algebra. And here it is, the trace of x. So x is, is in the graded algebra, so it suffices, def, suffices to define it on any graded piece. So we can suppose that x is in Pn. And I'm simply going to define this to be um, x. I'm going to take x. I'm going to put it in a, uh, a, a box with a certain number of boundary points. And I'm going to take the sum of all temporally lead diagrams of the ways of putting that. So this is an example of an element that I'm taking the sum over. So I'm tying these points on the boundary up in all possible planar fashions, temporally lead diagrams. So this is simply, this is nothing but the trace that Wojcicki defined in the case of the tensor, ne tensor networks, but the observation that that definition makes sense in an arbitrary unital planar algebra, planar planar algebra, star algebra, okay? So the, the trace is not a single diagram here, it's a sum of all possible things here. Any questions about that? Geometry, uh, this is not the oriented case. Okay, let me answer that question immediately. Let's do the oriented case. So we, we go back here, and instead of starting with a vanilla planar algebra, we start off with an oriented planar algebra. Then we go through the same game. We put orientations on all the strings, and we get another graded algebra. Except that now the algebra is graded by not by the natural numbers, but graded by these vectors with things going to them. Right, and then you know, the grading structure is just concatenate the vectors. So, <coughs> uh, 
Now, uh, so this gives a trace on the thing, and it will give a trace also in the oriented case. So what Wojcicki proved in the case of the tensor networks, this thing about random and it follows from because it's random matrices, is that this trace is a a trace, so trace of x y equals trace of y x, and also that it's positive definite. And finally, the, the other thing is that we want to do this so-called GNS construction, so we take the trace, we use it to define an inner product, and the, uh, the, um, then we take left multiplication operators, they have to be bounded. There's this technical boundedness condition coming from, from the operators. Anyway, he also proved that that is dissatisfied. And now, what we, what we were able to do was prove all of these three things for general uh, planar algebra with suitable positivity. Okay, and that will be true, just as true, uh, if there's orientations or not. Okay, but there's a there's a technical nightmare which goes in um, right at the start, which is that this inner product, so the new inner product we get, is not the same one that I talked about before. So what's the inner product between x and y in this Wojcicki? So we take x, we take y, we take the star of y. And in the old situation, these two would be orthogonal unless the number of points of the boundary was the same, and then we just connect them up with the dollar sign. But in the Wojcicki inner product, we take all possible temporally lead pairings here. We get a number in that way. So it's not at all obvious that this is uh, uh, positive definite, nor is it obvious how on earth you're going to work with it, because you know this this is an element of with four strings and this is an element of six strings and they're not orthogonal. There's going to be lots of ways of doing that. So um, we got around that initially by using uh, this, what was in the Wojcicki case would have been Fox space. Uh, we had a generalization of this Fox space to, uh, to an arbitrary planar algebra and we did this. We managed to do some kind of orthogonalization, but uh, independently. Um, Sunda and VJ and us, namely Kevin Walker, especially myself and uh, Dima, saw that there was a way, a very natural way, to sort of non-commutative Chebyshev polynomials to actually orthogonalize this whole picture. Um, <coughs> so, in other words, you could change, you could do a linear transformation which took this vector, took this graded vector space with this inner product and naturally map it into the graded vector space with another inner product. And in fact, the right, inner, the, not the right, but you know, the, the inner product that we're used to of the planar algebra, which the PNs are all, all orthogonal, and you just link them up in a, in a certain way. And it was that orthogonalization that was the key to simplifying this dramatically. Um, and that orthogonalization, of course, works in the oriented case in exactly the same way. Except that the things will, you know, if the orientation is done, if you have, say, all these four going out and all these, no, uh, no, the, you know, things are more, a bit more orthogonal even in the Wojcicki in the product than the orientation, oriented case. Um, the key to the proof of getting a 2 1 factor and so on, the key was that to study this element here, we call cup. And uh, the, the, the key lemma was that this cup is generates a maximal ABM in the other Well, not now that you're right, but this is maximal ABM. Now, VJ and Sunday didn't do it this way. They had a, a more direct, somehow, way of calculating. They did some more detailed uh, computations. But uh, to show that this is a matter is some very simple argument because by um, uh, using Hilbert Schmidt operators. So, and once this is a massive, then, then the fact that it's a factor is not so hard because you have to, anything that's in the center has to commute with this guy, therefore it's got to be in the algebra generated by that. You've just got to come up with something that doesn't commute with it. And the thing that we came up with was double cut. Okay, which is this guy. And then there was a slightly more painful computation to show that that, you know, there's nothing in the massive that commutes with that. Okay, in the oriented case, it's easier. It's even easier because there's two cups. Cup oriented this way and the cup oriented that way. 
<coughs> same analysis, this is the part where I haven't really written down the details, but every time I start, I can just mess up the words. The same analysis shows that they both generate matches, and they obviously, they, you don't even need to introduce double cut, because nothing in this algebra here can possibly uh, commute with the things in that algebra there. So that, and then, uh, once you've got that, then the correspondence is uh, easy to define. You just define the Hilbert space. You have the correspondence given by, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a matter of drawing pictures. You think of the correspondence as being the direct sum of all possible orientations up here of these vector spaces, the sum and the product, and the bimodular structure is just the left and right bimodular structure for that algebra. And that's the correspondence in this dual is obtained by reversing that arrow. So that's just some, those last sentences were directed to Sundar and Vijay. So that's, time has run out, so that's the end of my series of talks. I would like to have talked about lots of other things, including the classification of low index uh, subfactors, but I'm sort of happy to have said what I've said. <coughs> Thank you all for listening.